Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for the first video of a brand new series I'm doing here on my channel. It's a history series that doesn't actually have a name yet, I can't think of anything catchy to call this series. So if you've got any ideas then please make sure you stick them in the comments down below. Um, my aim with this series is to share stories that you probably don't know. I'm sure occasionally I will share like a more well known story. I really want to cover the Great Fire of London at some point and I'm sure you guys already will know quite a lot about that. But in general, I want to share the lesser known stories of history, stories of important people or important events that you probably haven't heard of. This is just basically for me. I am a huge, huge history nerd. I love learning things like this. I just find it so interesting. And to be honest, I didn't think anybody else would want this kind of series. But I kind of threw it out there on Twitter a few months ago and I've had people ask me about it non-stop ever since. So, I figured I'd do it. Obviously I'm not a professional, I'm not a historian, I am just a bit of a nerd who loves to learn new things and I love to share the things I learn as well. And so we're going to start this series by talking about the Radium Girls. I actually wasn't intending on covering this case for my first ever history video but I actually read a book on my Kindle which is called, sorry, two seconds. The book I read is called The Radium Girls by Kate Moore and that is where I've got the majority of the information I'm about to share with you. Obviously, I've condensed an entire book into one probably kind of short video. So if you do want to learn more about this topic, I would highly, highly recommend The Radium Girls by Kate Moore. But let's start our story in 1898 with Marie and Pierre Curie. You've probably heard of them. They are probably two of the most famous scientists in history. Marie became curious about the potential existence of a new element when she learned about x-rays. And I'm not talking about x-rays in terms of like the x-rays we have to show our bones. I'm talking about x-rays coming from a different element, coming from uranium. Please bear in mind that I'm hugely, hugely summarising the discovery of radium here because this video isn't about the discovery of radium, it's about the radium girls. But I figured it's important to give you a little bit of background on it. Um, so in 1986, a man called Henry Becquerel discovered that uranium salts emitted rays. And these rays were unlike anything anybody had ever really seen in the scientific world because most elements that sort of emit these rays are caused to do so by an external heat source or something like that. But Henry Becquerel discovered that uranium salt just emitted these rays constantly with no external power source. Marie Curie hears about this and she decides to investigate it further. By mid-1898, Marie's husband Pierre abandons his own work that he's been doing on crystals because he sees that the work that Marie is doing with this potential new element is really, really interesting. Although don't for a second think that Marie let Pierre take responsibility for this. It was her idea, she put in most of the hard work, Pierre just sort of joined her to help her, and she made sure everyone knew that she, a woman, was responsible for this new discovery. A very long and sciencey story short, the Curies eventually succeed in isolating what they called Element 84, which they named Polonium, which was named after Poland, their native land. And then shortly after, they discovered Element 88, Radium. In 1903, the Curies and Henry Becquerel share the Nobel Prize for Physics. And Marie was actually the first ever woman to receive a Nobel Prize. She'd go on to get another one in 1911. And then her daughter would also get one, Irene, in 1935. In a nutshell, that's the discovery of radium and it's released to the wide world in 1902. Now by this point, people still didn't fully understand radium and what exactly it did, but it was viewed as this wondrous medical marvel. All they really knew about radium was that it glowed in the dark and it constantly gave off this slight warmth, but that was pretty much it. But almost from the start, radium is championed as the greatest find in history. And Marie and Pierre had discovered that radium could destroy human tissue, and so it's put to work really, really quickly, destroying cancerous tumours. And it does a great job at that. I mean, still today, a mildly radioactive form of radium is occasionally used to treat some cancers. But as you'll come to find out, radium has its detrimental effects. Because of all its potential life-saving properties, it was assumed that radium was incredibly healthy. I mean, if it could destroy cancer cells, then it can 
solve anything, surely. It was the new wonder element. Doctors and anybody else who sold anything medical used it as a cure-all. Radium can cure anything. Any kind of ailment you could think of, there was some kind of radium product to fix that ailment. There were radium wound dressings, radium water, radium clinics and radium spas. It was everywhere, particularly in the USA. It shone like a beacon of light, literally, for anybody who was suffering, but what they didn't realise was radium was actually slowly killing people from the inside out. And then in April 1917, the USA joins World War I. All of the men are carted off to war and the girls are left at home to help with the war effort in any way that they could. Working class females across America flock to all of the factories trying to get any job that they could. But there was one particular job that everyone wanted dial painting. Dial painting paid three times the average factory wage and those lucky enough to get a job as a dial painter in a factory were in the top 5% of female workers. Dial painting wasn't a salary job though, you were paid one and a half cents per watch face that you painted. So the quicker you were and the better you were at your job, the more you got paid and people really really liked that because it gave them motivation. Every girl wanted to be a dial painter, but obviously there were only so many jobs, but you had to be skilled to do well in this job because you're working with one of the most valuable materials on earth at this point, radium. Back in 1917, radium would sell for $150,000 per gram. In today's money, that's about $2.2 million for one gram. Radium centric businesses started to pop up all across America but mostly on the east coast which was closer to the war effort. In this episode I'm going to be focusing particularly on just one of these factories though, the Radium Luminous Materials Corporation which was based in Newark, New Jersey. The girls that worked there were painting watch dials, painstakingly painting luminous numbers on the watch dials and you know how small watches are, you're talking like this big and the tiny little numbers on it using the most valuable material on earth. You couldn't afford to make any mistakes here. And they needed to be painted with radium because the radium would glow in the dark, making it perfect for military use. The girls in this particular company worked in a bright open studio where they'd sit in rows on wooden benches with tables in front of them and next to them they would have these wooden trays full of watch dials. The paper dials were pre-printed on a black background leaving the white numerals bare, ready to be painted. Each girl was responsible for mixing her own paint. They would dab a tiny amount of radium powder which was radium mixed with zinc sulphide which would just give this this amazing glow and they'd sort of mix it into a small white bowl with a dash of water and a gum arabic adhesive and the paint was called undark paint. It glowed with this greenish white luminosity. The smallest watches the girls would have to paint would be just three and a half centimetres across, meaning that some of the numbers on these dials weren't even a millimetre in width. They had to be so precise. Which meant, of course, they had to use really slim paint brushes as well. They would use camel hair brushes with narrow wooden handles, and each brush would only have about 30 hairs on it, so very, very fine. But as the girls worked, the hairs would inevitably spread, which meant they couldn't do their job properly. And so they used a technique called lip pointing, where they would raise the brush up to their mouth and sort of like moisten the tip between their lips to bring it back to a point. Each time they would do this, they would swallow a minuscule amount of radium powder from the paint. Some girls would lip point their brush after every single number on the dial. For each dial, that's 12 times you're ingesting a small amount of radium. In a day, they could paint up to 100 dials if they were good at their job. And the worst thing of all of it though, is that the girls were told it was completely safe to do so. Some would even ask their supervisors if this was really healthy and each time they were told, yeah, it's perfectly healthy. It's probably even good for you. But the bosses, the people higher up in the factory, did know otherwise. They knew that radium could have its detrimental effects. Radium was known to be hazardous. Other employees working in the exact same company handling larger amounts of radium were only allowed to touch the radium with tongs, they wore protective lead aprons, they wore goggles on their eyes. The company knew that radium was bad for people, but they still let the girls lip point. 
Like I said, some of them were even told it was healthy, it was good for them to ingest the radium, saying that it would make them more beautiful, that it would make their cheeks glow. And of course it kind of did do this, like some of these girls literally had this glow to them, at least if it's not their skin, over their clothes which was kind of covered in radium powder all the time. But what they didn't know was that whilst this radium may have given them this beautiful glow, it was also eating their bones from the inside or growing the beginning stages of tumours that would grow to be the size of footballs. Some girls even wore their evening dresses to work during the day if they knew they were going out to a dance or on a date that night because they would leave glowing. The Radium Luminous Materials Corporation was founded by a man called Sabin Von so hockey, I'm re I cannot pronounce this word. I'm just gonna get it up on here so you guys can hear how it should be pronounced. Sohovsky. 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 So Sohovsky. So I'm, I'm just gonna call him Sabin from now on. Um, he was an Austrian-born doctor in his mid thirties, and he'd been the one to invent the undark paint, the paint with the radium in it. And in his first year of trading with the Radium Luminous Materials Corporation, he sold 2,000 watches. By the time the war started, it was millions of watches a year. But most people simply referred to him as the Doctor, and it would be a very exciting day whenever the Doctor would be spotted on the factory floor because it was so rare. Now Sabin knew the dangers of radium better than anyone. He'd been working with it for years, and he'd personally suffered its side effects when it actually got into his left index finger and he had to amputate part of his finger to get the sort of radium out of his system. And it's due to this that the workers in the factory were told to wear protective gear when they were handling the radium. He wrote that one could only handle radium when taking the greatest protection. Despite this and the fact that he had to amputate part of his own finger, he actually handled radium himself with very little care because he deemed scientific knowledge more important than his own health. He ordered the workers in his factory who were handling large amounts of radium to always wear protective gear. But it seems like the radium girls, the dial painters, got a little bit overlooked here because they were literally ingesting it but it was thought to be healthy to have it in just small amounts. The dial painters handled radium without a care in the world because they were told again and again and again that it was entirely, entirely safe. And from as far as I'm aware, this wasn't actually to Sabin's knowledge. He had very little idea what was going on with the dial painters. They weren't really important to him in the grand scheme of things. Until one day when he just happened to be walking through the studio where the dial painters worked. And there was one girl called Grace Fryer. Grace said that she was doing her work as usual that day, lip pointing the brush every few strokes. But Sabin apparently walked through and caught sight of her doing this and he looked her in the eye and said, don't do that. Grace looks at him, she's a bit confused because the founder of the company is speaking to her and he repeats again, do not do that, you will get sick. And then he just walks away and Grace immediately goes to a supervisor and tells the supervisor what Sabin just said to her and the supervisor once again says, nope, it's perfectly safe, carry on what you're doing. It was 1922 when the first girl started showing signs of illness. One of Grace's colleagues was a woman called Molly Magia. Now Molly actually had to quit her job because she'd got so ill recently and of course she had no idea what was causing it. It all started when she had an aching tooth and so Molly goes to the dentist expecting them just to remove the tooth and then that's it. And that's what happens, she goes to the dentist and they pull the tooth out and she goes on her way expecting the toothache to stop but it doesn't. The wound in her gum refuses to heal. It's just abscess after abscess, this open sore in her mouth. And then the next tooth starts hurting, and then the next, and Molly's dentist pulls out every single tooth that's causing her an issue, only it just gets worse. Her mouth was constantly seeping with all of this pus from the abscesses and the ulcers, and it caused her to have horrific breath all the time, there was nothing she could do about it. She had aches in her limbs as well, her legs hurt, her arms hurt, just everything hurt. By May 1922, Molly had lost most of her teeth, one day she went into her dentist again with the same complaint and so her dentist goes in her mouth and attempts to pull another tooth. Only it's not just the tooth that comes out, her entire jaw crumbles in his hand. He literally removes part of her jaw by lifting it out of her mouth and there was no effort put into this, it just crumbled. 
Nobody could give her any kind of diagnosis. Nobody knew what was wrong with Molly Magia. And by this point as well, other girls in the factory had also started to have these symptoms. Some of them were having aching jaws, some of them were having aching limbs, some of them couldn't get out of bed in the morning because it hurt so much. But this was years after they'd first started working at the factory. Most of the girls worked at the factory between sort of 1917, 1919, 1920, but this was 22. And so most of them had moved on. They weren't really in contact anymore. So they couldn't compare their symptoms. On September 12th, 1922, the infection spread to Molly's throat where it ate through her jugular vein and Molly literally choked to death on her own blood. She was just 24 years old when she died and the doctor writes on her death certificate that she died of syphilis despite a syphilis test coming back as negative when she was alive. Molly was the first of many girls to die from the effects of radium. Molly's dentist was a man called Dr. Joseph Neff. Now he was an expert in unusual mouth diseases and he worked closely with Molly for many, many months before her death. She was spending more time at the dentist than she was at the doctor's because the majority of her problems were in her jaw. Um, and he determined that she was suffering from a condition not unlike phosphorus poisoning, which is also known as fossy jaw. It had very, very similar symptoms to whatever it was that Molly was suffering with. Tooth loss, gum inflammation, necrosis and pain. And he'd asked Molly at one point what it is she did for a living and she tells him that she worked with radium. And with that, Dr. Neff becomes the first person to potentially link Molly's symptoms to the use of radium. But he doesn't immediately link her symptoms to the radium. He thinks that in the paint there is also phosphorus. And so Dr. Joseph Neff takes matters into his own hands. He actually goes down to the factory himself and asks them for the formula of the compound, wanting to find out if phosphorus was involved in any way here. And of course he's completely refused this information. He's not allowed to find out what exactly is in the paint. But he was told explicitly that no phosphorus was used here and that the factory work and nothing to do with Molly's illness. But across New Jersey, more and more girls are going to their doctors with very similar symptoms, but each case is different enough to not link it to the last. Sometimes the disease started in their jaw, sometimes it started in their feet, in their hands. Sometimes it caused stillborn babies or miscarriages and the girls who are still in contact slowly begin to put two and two together. They realise that so many of them who worked at this same factory are now suffering very similar symptoms. One of these girls was called Irene Rudolph and she'd been having tooth trouble since around spring 1922, around the same time that Molly first started suffering with her own symptoms. And so Irene is visiting her dentist regularly and her story is exactly the same as Molly Maggia's. She had teeth removed and it wouldn't heal, it would just cause ulcers and abscesses and it was just generally very gross. Now her dentist also asks her where she worked and makes the potential connection to phosphorus poisoning or fossy jaw. Unable to actually diagnose Irene with anything and say exactly what she's suffering with, he simply puts her illness down to some occupational trouble. At this point, people were beginning to make the connection to radium, but radium was such a big corporation. I'm not just talking about the Radium Luminous Materials Corporation, I'm talking about hundreds of radium companies across the country. It was huge money, it was just massive, and nobody wanted to question it. Irene hears through the grapevine about Molly Maggia's death and she refuses to believe that syphilis was the cause of Molly's death because Molly wasn't the kind of girl who would get syphilis. And the symptoms were way too similar to her own to be some kind of coincidence. Um, she tells the doctors Molly's story as well as the story of another girl she's heard of that has very similar symptoms as well. And she tells them where they all worked and that they all kind of are suffering with the same thing and the doctors don't do anything with this information. But in December 1922, Irene's case is actually reported to the Industrial Hygiene Division as a case of phosphorus poisoning. And they're basically urging the hygiene division to investigate into this further, which they actually do. They turn up at the factory a few days later and they sort of just watch. The inspector there notices the lip pointing going on and he can't believe it because he knows that that can't be healthy. And he brings the lip pointing to the attention of the management who actually say that they've warned the girls time and time again that lip pointing is dangerous and they shouldn't do it. But the girls just won't listen to them. 
which of course was a complete lie. Not a single dial painter ever reported being told that radium and lip pointing was dangerous. They were actually encouraged to do it. The inspector actually takes a sample of the Undark paint and sends it to a man called John Roach, who was the deputy commissioner for the New Jersey Department of Labor because he basically wants to test it and make sure that it's safe. The inspector also speaks to a big radium authority who confirmed that there have never been any reports of necrosis in the bones as a result of radium. The investigation therefore concludes that the case of Irene Rudolph and the case of another girl who has pretty much exactly the same symptoms, a girl called Hazel Vincent, are probably an accidental coincidence resulting from abscessed teeth and incompetent dental surgery. However, John Roach, the Deputy Commissioner for the New Jersey Department of Labor, actually writes in January 1923 that it is my belief that the serious condition of the jaw has been caused by the influence of radium. It was a radical idea at the time and nobody wanted to take it any further because the radium companies were so big, they had so much money and America needed money at this time. But people did know about the dangers of radium, this wasn't this brand new radical idea. Papers have been written about the dangers of radium since 1900. Even Marie and Pierre Curie had written about the dangers of radium themselves. But at the end of the day, radium was making the country money and so nobody wanted to do anything about it. But it would be another couple of years and dozens of more deaths before the connection between the radium paint and the girl's illnesses could be confirmed. Now by this point, the Radium Luminous Materials Corporation had changed their name to the United States Radium Company. And the United States Radium Company denied any connection to these deaths for almost two years. But in the end, their business was suffering so much from all this gossip that they decided to do something about it themselves. They actually commissioned an independent expert in 1924 to look into this rumoured link. This expert confirmed the link 100% and says like, yep, yeah, radium is the cause of these girls' illnesses. And the president of the firm is absolutely outraged. Now, by this point, Sabin is no longer involved with his own company. He may have been the founder, but he was forced out many years before this. Um, and this new president, instead of just accepting the findings and trying to make things a safer working environment, decides to then pay for new studies that will find the opposite results. He actually goes on to lie to the Department of Labour about the original findings and says that the original findings said that there wasn't a link, even though there definitely was. And these girls were coming to him, the president of the company that caused their illness, asking for medical help. They needed money to pay their medical bills and they were rejected time and time again. Not only were these women so, so ill, this also meant they were unable to work and so they were unable to pay their medical debts. And in some cases they couldn't have any medical help at all because they just couldn't afford it. And then in 1925, a brilliant doctor named Harrison Martland actually takes an interest in the girls' cases. And he proves definitively that radium was poisoning these girls from the inside out. He'd recently been appointed as the new county physician. So now with this new position of power, he was actually able to make a difference. And so he actually starts to look into this properly. And it just so happens on the 7th of June, 1925, that same year, the first male employee of the United States Radium Corporation dies, a man called Dr. Lehman. Now, Dr. Lehman's hands actually started to form these blackened lesions, and he suddenly died aged 36 from pernicious anemia. And this made the company pay attention because now it wasn't just these young girls that were dying, a man had died. That's sexism in the early 20th century for you. These women were literally dying because people refused to listen to them. They just were written off as being hysterical. One man dies and people pay attention. And so Dr. Lehman becomes the first person affected by radium to have an autopsy, something that none of the girls who had died at this point had been granted. Um, Dr. Martland suspected radium poisoning from the get-go, but the chemical analysis he does in the body shows no sign of this element because nothing had been invented to test for radium at this point. And so he turns to Sabin, an authority on radium, for his assistance. And shockingly, he also turns to the United States Radium Corporation themselves as well, because he needs specialist equipment. He needs space to be able to do this autopsy the way he wants to do it. They allow him to use their factory for testing as long as he doesn't tell anyone what the results are. And so Sabin and Dr. Martland reduce Dr. Lehman's bones to ashes. 
and they test these ashes with an instrument known as an electrometer. The results were off the charts. These ashes were saturated with radioactivity. And so finally, science had a confirmation that radium affected the human body. And Dr. Lehman hadn't been ingesting the radium, he was simply handling it. The girls were literally swallowing it into their bodies every day for years. This is all the confirmation that Dr. Martin needs. He now has proof that radium poisoning is a real thing. And so he decides to head to the hospital to meet two sisters who are currently suffering with the disease. These were Marguerite Carlo and her sister, Sarah Malefer. Now, Marguerite had been in hospital for a while at this point. She was barely able to move. She was so, so ill. The radium had literally eaten its way through her bones. They were like honeycomb. And Sarah had been visiting her sister in hospital for the past few months, but she was very, very ill herself. She was covered in these black and blue spots, kind of like bruises, and she could barely walk anymore, constantly limping and having to walk with a stick. Martin knew that he had to test these sisters in the hospital to see if radium was the cause of their illness, but the only way he knew how to test for it at this point was reducing the bones to ashes, and of course he couldn't do that with live patients. And so Dr. Martland and Sabin devised the gamma ray test, which involved the girls sitting before an electroscope to read the gamma radiation coming off of their bodies. As well as this, they devised what they called the expired air method, which meant the girls needed to breathe into an electroscope to measure the amount of radium on their breath. By this point, Sarah's been admitted into the hospital very, very ill herself, and so Martland goes to her bedside and holds an electrometer a few inches above Sarah's chest. They're looking for a leak of radium coming off her body, and the result is off the charts. They then did the breath test, and she emitted a huge amount of radium with every single breath that she exhaled. Sarah died just a week after this, before Marguerite did. And so they do a full autopsy on Sarah, the first radium girl to have an autopsy. The women's bodies were releasing a constant amount of radium, and this radium destroyed their bodies from the inside. Their bones literally looked like honeycombs. They were so, so weak. Every moment of every day, the radium was eating away at their bones. Um, the autopsy revealed that Sarah's left leg was actually four centimeters shorter than her right because of the effect the radium had been having. Every single one of her bones was radioactive, as well as her organs. Just to make sure and to satisfy any remaining scientific curiosity, Martland conducts one last test. He takes portions of Sarah's bones and he places them in a box with dental film over the top and then he leaves the dark box in a dark room for about 60 hours. When he goes back to check on it, Sarah's bones had emitted so much radiation that on the film there were just white patches. This sort of confirmed what Martland had suspected, that even after Sarah's death, the radium in her bones was still very much alive. It confirmed his worst fear, that once radium was in the body, there was no way of removing it. Radium has a half-life of 1,600 years, and a half-life refers to the amount of time it takes for the concentration of any substance to decrease by half. So 1,600 years after these girls' deaths, the radium in their bodies will be just down to half of what it was when they were alive. Meaning that to this day, right now, Sarah's bones and the bones of any other radium girl are still emitting radioactivity in their coffins underground. And they will continue to do so as long as we're alive, as long as our children are alive, our great, great, great grandchildren. There is nothing known to science that will eliminate or change or neutralize radium. That's it, those bones are radioactive for 1,600 years at least. The girls have been searching for years for some kind of diagnosis, some cure, and now they had half their answer, they had a diagnosis, but now they had to live with the fact that there was no cure for this, this was going to kill them. Dr. Martland shares the cause of Sarah's death with the world. There is not the slightest doubt, he wrote, that she died of acute anemia caused by the ingestion of luminous paint. The only option they really had was to now sue their previous employer. Radium poisoning was a thing and it was killing them and they needed some kind of compensation for that. 
The first legal suit was actually filed by Grace Fryer and she was turned down by countless attorneys. Nobody would take this case on because it was huge and nobody wanted to face the radium companies. But she's eventually taken on in 1927 by a lawyer called Raymond Berry. Now the girls facing this lawsuit were Grace Fryer, a woman called Catherine Schaub, Edna Hussman, and Molly Maggio's two sisters, Albina Larice and Quinta McDonald. And they filed a lawsuit for $250,000 each, which is about $3.4 million today. But the radium companies pulled out all of the stops to win. They said that each girl had such different symptoms that there's no way to prove that it was all caused by the same thing. And they also said that radium poisoning wasn't a recognized disease which it wasn't. The companies refused to offer any kind of compensation, but they did eventually agree to settle with the girls outside of court. Um, the girls were actually paid $10,000 each, which is about $100,000 a day, which considering what they went through is just a meager amount. It's nothing. It would barely scratch the surface of their medical bills. But at the end of the day, these girls all knew they only had a matter of months to live, if that. And did they want to waste the last few months of their life in a big legal battle? No, they didn't. But Grace was more than happy with this because she'd got what she wanted. She wanted to raise awareness of radium poisoning and that is exactly what she'd been able to do through this lawsuit. And it did eventually lead to improvements of workers' safety and this sort of spread across the country to other dial painting factories across the USA. Bear in mind this was the 1920s and news didn't spread back then like it did now. Whilst all of this was going on in New Jersey, other doll painting factories in other states across America had no idea what was going on. They had no idea that ingesting this paint was dangerous. But after the lawsuit, the word did slowly begin to spread. And it was in the 1930s that a woman named Catherine Wolf Donahue developed a grapefruit sized tumor on her hip and her jaw begins to fall apart. Catherine wasn't from New Jersey. She was from Ottawa in Illinois, where she worked for a different radium dial painting factory. She had been completely unaware of the battle going on between the Radium Girls and the corporations in New Jersey. But after the lawsuit, the girls in Ottawa heard what was going on and they began to fear for their lives. For them, they now knew it was just a case of waiting for the first symptoms to appear. And they always did. And so once Catherine starts forming these tumours, she begins her own fight for justice. Now bear in mind, this was during the midst of the Great Depression and America wasn't doing well at all. Radium was one of the only things that was kind of keeping the economy even a little bit afloat. And so Catherine wasn't popular going after the radium companies, but she did it anyway. A lawyer called Leonard Grossman agreed to work pro bono for Catherine. She took the fight to the courts and she was rejected time and time and time again. Catherine and Leonard appealed eight times before they eventually won their lawsuit in 1939. Catherine literally gave evidence on her deathbed against her doctor's advice. The judge condemned the radium companies for gross negligence and this was one of the first times in history that a company was made responsible for the health of their employers. This wasn't a thing back then. Nowadays, there's all these health and safety laws. Back in the 1920s, it just wasn't something that happened. The company wasn't responsible for their workers' health. It led to new life-saving regulations across not just radium factories, all factories. And it eventually led to the establishment of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which still operates now in America, protecting the workers because of the hard work of these girls and their refusal to give up. Before these new laws, over 14,000 people would die in factories in America every single year. Nowadays, it's just over four and a half thousand and you better believe that companies are held responsible if somebody dies whilst working there. To be honest, I still think four and a half thousand is a number that's way too high here. The legacy that these girls left behind is absolutely incredible. They fought for justice, not just for themselves, but for everybody else. They knew that they were going to die. They did this to protect future generations. And they went into court with their jaws crumbling out of their mouths with abscesses in their gums. They had radium literally eating away at their bones and they still went into court and they fought this. 
They knew they were dying and they used their last time on this earth to fight these multi-million dollar corporations. They knew they were dying and they used their last months on this earth to fight these multi-million dollar corporations who refused to listen to women. And the indirect contributions as well that they made to science is astonishing. Obviously this wasn't voluntary, but everything that we know about radium in the human body is because of these girls. Their suffering led to huge advances in technology and safety with radium in everyday life. I mean, nowadays you can't walk down the street and buy radium water because of the way that these girls fought. It's been almost a hundred years and these girls' bones will still be radioactive in their coffins. Years after Molly Maggia's death, her family actually exhumed her body and when they opened the coffin, her bones were literally still glowing. If a scientist was to walk over one of these girls' graves with a Geiger counter, it would show undeniable amounts of radioactivity and that would be through mounds and mounds of earth and a lead coffin and it will continue to show this for as long as we live. And that is the story of the radium girls who are mostly forgotten in history but the contribution they made to science and to safety shouldn't be forgotten. And I think that's going to be the point of these videos, to tell you the stories that shouldn't be forgotten. So if you have any recommendations, anything that you want to hear me talk about, then please make sure you put them in the comments down below. Um, I'm not going to have any particular schedule for these videos, I've got a lot on my plate with Midweek Mystery every Wednesday and Serial Killer Spotlight on the last Saturday every month, so I don't want to like commit to another proper date for these, um, but maybe I will in the future, I just don't want to fully go in there and like put a lot of pressure on myself. So I'll just do them as and when, when something takes my fancy, maybe every couple of months, maybe more, maybe less, we'll see. Um, thank you so much for watching, I do hope you enjoyed this, I know it's different, I'm a bit nervous to upload it to be honest, but... I think the story is really important um, and subscribe to my channel and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.